Thanks, everybody, for joining us again for our uh, interviews for the Ingenuism Project. Today, I'm excited to have one of the most prominent economists uh, in, uh, in the US, in the world, Tyler Cowan, joining us. Tyler is uh, a professor of economics at George Mason University, serves as the chairman and the faculty director of the Mercatus Center at GMU. Uh, with colleague Alex Tabarok, uh, Cowan is co-author of the popular economics blog, Marginal Revolution, and co-founder of the online educational platform, Marginal Revolution University, both of which I highly recommend. A dedicated writer and communicator of economic ideas, Cowan is uh, the author of several books, many books, more than I can mention here, but let me mention his latest, uh, Big Business, A Love Letter to an American Anti-Hero, which uh, we reviewed in our newsletter a few weeks ago. Um, he writes for Bloomberg, uh, he's written for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and on and on. Uh, I'll mention two other books, which I think are relevant to the discussion we're going to be talking, uh, the topic we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the Great Stagnation, How America Ate All the Low-Hanging Fruit of Modern History, Got Sick and Will Eventually Feel Better, uh, which was published in 2011. And Average is Over, Powering America Beyond the Age of the Great Stagnation, uh, which was published in 2013. Uh, welcome, Tyler. It's nice to see you. Nice to be here. Thank you. So uh, two years ago, you published a article in The Atlantic with Patrick Collison uh, titled, We Need a New Science of Progress. Um, why? What, you know, what is it about progress that we need that we don't understand? Viewing this from the academic world, I see far too much over-specialization. So people apply a great deal of technique to a very narrow question. Uh, they may end up doing quite good research in terms of the quality, but somehow the bigger picture questions, how is capitalism sustainable? How does economic growth happen? What can we do to boost the economic growth or to make science function or innovate more effectively? Uh, to me, those should be far, far, far more central questions in academic discourse than they are today. And that's what I meant by progress studies. And, and it's, it, you know, and it's beyond economics, right? I mean, we're talking about here a kind of an interdisciplinary approach to what the causes of, of economic and human progress more broadly. Sure. If you look, for instance, at media, there are particular very negative topics typically that media like to cover, like, oh, do rich people get away with not paying enough taxes? Uh, the questions to do with progress and economic growth uh, don't necessarily get reader clicks. They're not an obsession of the media. Uh, I think they should be. They are the important questions. So you end up with this negativity bias and uh, matters related to, to Donald Trump or, or class issues or, I mean, just open up to any page of the New York Times and it will smack you right in the face. Not enough attention paid to economic growth, progress and the institutions of science. And why do you think that is? Well, if you mean media, I think it's, partly a commercial incentive. Again, it's not necessarily what readers want. So the New York Times on Tuesday will have a whole section devoted to science, which is great. I'm delighted to see that. But when you raise the question, well, how could we do science better? How many op-eds on the front page really consider that at all over the span of years? It's very close to zero. Uh, but I think some of it is ideology. So a lot of ideologies out there in the intellectual marketplace, there's a bias toward the negative, not toward celebrating the achievements of mankind. And so you're, you're not gonna be inclined to focus on progress and capitalism and the growth of wealth. So, you know, we live in a culture, it seems, that takes progress for granted. And, and it part of, partially it's ideological, as you mentioned, maybe psychological. I mean, people like to be focused on the negative and not the positive, but it, it, it does seem strange given the amount of progress we've experienced over the last 250 years. But of course, progress comes unevenly. So since 1973, economic growth has been slower. Productivity growth has been slower. And in any given year, arguably it's not a big deal. You might not even notice it. But if you compound that over decades, it makes an enormous difference in standards of living. And I think that that's the intellectual crime we're committing is not to grasp the importance of compounding over time. Yeah, you give the example in the article of uh, 
if you improve the standard of living by 1% a year, children by adulthood will be 35% better off than their parents. But if you improve the livelihood by 3% a year, then it's two and a half times better off, uh, which is a, a, a dramatic, dramatic improvement. Generally, people seem to underestimate the effects of a compounding. Correct. Even in their personal lives, but certainly when we think about policy. So to what extent do you think focusing from an academic perspective on progress studies can change that, can, can, can alter that over time? Well, I'm genuinely not sure. You know, I don't believe in setting up an independent Department of Progress Studies. I'm not sure what it would do or how it would attract majors. But if you just take universities as we find them, if we can get some number of additional people to be interested in these questions, to me, that is itself a form of progress. So the response to the piece Patrick and I wrote has been very strong. This weekend, I'm going to a whole conference based around related ideas. People write me about something related to progress studies virtually every day. Uh, so I've been very heartened, but really, I'm not sure how much a difference it's going to make. I wouldn't pretend to be succeeding. I don't know. Well, it takes time, but you know, intellectuals have an influence over time. So hopefully, hopefully this will this will make a big difference. Um, so say a little bit about what you call the great stagnation. You you indicated that since the 1970s, early 70s economic growth has slowed significantly. Uh, what characterizes the great stagnation and uh, why, you know, why did it happen? Well, opinions differ. I, I can give you my opinion, sure. but just to cite what is to me a very striking fact. I mean, let's go back right before the pandemic to take, take that event off the table. Uh, only right before the pandemic did the real wage for the median male earner achieve the level it had in 1969. Now I get there's a measurement problem. We don't measure real wages that well. There's a lot of free things in the world today, like you can read Wikipedia for free that, that are not in that calculation. So I don't wanna say there hasn't been progress for men, but the mere fact that by using standard numbers, it can be somewhat of an open question whether there's been measured progress at all. Uh, I think shows something has gone wrong. So some of it I think is we regulate business too much, but I think the number one factor uh, is simply that we had these incredible technologies of fossil fuels and powerful machines. We did so many great things with them, right? Cars, planes, electricity, radio. And then, you know, at some margin, the incremental improvements to say your car just weren't that important. Mm -hmm. Slide airbags. Well, that's nice, but it's not like going from a horse to a car. So I'm not a pessimist overall. I think we will have new big breakthroughs and have a lot more progress in the future. But you periodically have a big breakthrough, and then after a while, it exhausts itself. And then later on, you have another thing. So some of the time, you're in these periods of relative exhaustion. And that's the main thing I think happened. But again, this is disputed. Uh, I would not wish to pretend my view was in any way proven. Sure. So how do you how do you square this with the with the fact that certainly since the 1980s um, we've seen this dramatic increase in corporate wealth uh, wealth creation? You know the Amazons, the Apples, the Googles, and and dozens of others that have just been um, created immense amounts of wealth and as you said, created all, some of these products are relatively for free or Amazon Prime that deliveries for free. We get the same product, but we get it to our home, kind of the added convenience. Uh, how do we measure these things? And how do, we, how, do we, how do we square the fact that wages may be flat, but quality of life, standard of living might have increased? Well, I think if you're in the top, say 15% in the United States, your standard of living has gone up a great deal over the last few decades. Uh, but for people who are in what we used to call the middle class, I think it's a much tougher comparison. You look at the price of housing or how much you have to spend to get your kid in an above average school district, how you will cope with higher education that is much more expensive and arguably worse. Talk about things we don't measure, right? They don't all cut in the positive direction. Uh, healthcare, very complicated, but it seems quite inadequate to me in many ways. Mm -hmm. 
So I think for a significant percentage of Americans, uh, they're only a bit better off. And it's true, they can, you know, chat with their grandkids on Facebook. That's a, a very real gain, not, not really in the numbers. Uh, but overall, I consider it uh, quite disappointing. And you see this in a lot of the social indicators. But again, not for people of higher income and education. There's been this bifurcation. And what do you think is driving there for the, the, the wealth creation in the stock market? Or, the, or is there, you know, should we think about these as two separate phenomena? Well, there's multiple factors. You know, some of it is the stock market is far less representative of the total economy than it used to be. So uh, the stock market doing well tells you less than in times past. But I think also, and this relates to the gains of the top 10 or 15%, if you can export your product, the world has so many, many more customers. So Apple is maybe the simplest example. You sell iPhones to the whole world. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people doing that are much, much richer. That is not stagnation at all. So you can think of Americans as either exporting to the world or not. And again, the exporters have had a, a great time. It's just that's a minority of us. I write books, sell them in many countries. I give talks abroad. I'm an exporter, right? Sure. Uh, yeah. 40 years ago, I would not have been invited to South Korea to give a public talk for pay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, LeBron James is an exporter and, and he makes a lot more money than even Michael Jordan did because the market for basketball is so much larger today in a globalized environment than it was even 30 years ago. Yeah, the Israeli tech scene, which I'm sure you know plenty about. Uh, pretty phenomenal, relies on global markets. Uh, but again, that's not the entire population of most countries. So uh, is it over? Is the great stagnation over? Or have we turned a corner? Is there, are there hints that maybe things are getting better? Uh, how, how, would you, how would you measure that? How would you, uh, you know, where do we see that? Is it gonna my be opinion, in, close? in my opinion, the great stagnation is probably over now. Uh, but I'm reluctant to commit to that point of view. I think in the middle of a pandemic, all of your typical numbers are so misleading. But look, I've had two Moderna vaccines and now I am safe. That's a big deal. It will save the world trillions of dollars in GDP, untold numbers of lives. Uh, that's no guarantee the great stagnation is over forever. But if you just look at the last year, there's a pretty phenomenal advance in science. It's not a marginal gain. I think you ought to count it as a big deal and say, at least for now, the great stagnation is over. Uh, but keep an open mind about the next 10 years. It could be, you know, a, a one act trick, so to speak. I don't so, think it will be. I think there's a lot of fundamental advance in biology going on behind the vaccines that will translate into a lot of other breakthroughs. But again, we need to see. So you've seen the, the primary breakthroughs being in biology or... Do you see it in other fields of, of human endeavor as well? I think biology are the most important ones for well-being. So we've gone through a few decades where there were not that many breakthroughs in biomedical science that translated into people living longer. So the last few years, again, this is before the pandemic, US life expectancy went down, not up. That's not a good sign for whatever the reasons may be. Uh, I think those days are over. And in multiple areas, we'll see breakthroughs. I don't think they're the only breakthroughs, uh, but I strongly suspect they'll prove to be the most important ones. So what changed? Is it just a buildup of knowledge and, and, and now we reach a certain tipping point or is there something in the environment around us that has shifted and changed? I believe it is the democratization of computing power. Mm -hmm. The fact that scientists all over the world and these vaccines, as you know, come not only from the United States, can access just incredible computing power and do research in a high powered way that was not possible 20 years ago. And that took some time to translate into actual products. But that's why I think there'll be much more than just mRNA vaccines against COVID. Uh, the number of smart people doing work with access to these incredible powers they didn't have earlier. And you see it even in things where the product hasn't come yet. So early on in the pandemic, you have scientists basically testing every substance known to mankind. And by computation, getting a good idea, does it have any potential against COVID without even having to run the test? And that to me is just phenomenal. I think it's gonna to lead to a lot of different kinds of gains. Yeah, I mean, I've t you know, 
I've talked about the fact that we now have 8 billion people. I mean, maybe that's an exaggeration, basically connected, all connected yeah. to the internet, um, all carrying computing devices with them. That's 8 billion minds working on problems. I, I mean, to me, that is one of the great sources of optimism in, in terms of the, the, the potential for progress in the future. But if you're in a lab, you know, in almost any country, and you want to buy very powerful computing services mm -hmm. from Amazon, wherever, I mean, you can just do it. It costs a bit, but it's an open, open season. And, you know, there's anti-malaria vaccines that seem yeah. like they're going to work, using CRISPR to defeat sickle cell anemia. I just think there's going to be a flood. We're seeing it already. Uh, I'm very optimistic. Are we also seeing more labs? So it's one thing to have more computing power, but it strikes me with the opening up of so much of the world to somewhat free markets, somewhat. Uh, we're seeing also more labs, more scientists, more engineers in the world working in these problems. Absolutely. And places like China and India, which I wouldn't call free, no. and I, they're not even quite wealthy yet, but they're on their way and they have segments in those societies doing uh, very creative things. Yeah, and, they, and, they, and they're integrated into the world in a way that with past technology would have been very hard for them to be. That's right. So uh, again, way more reasons to be optimistic. People think, because I wrote a book called The Great Stagnation, I just, I'm an eternal pessimist, but I'm not. <laughs> I just think you have periods of doldrums. Uh, a lot of American history, you have periods where there are not major breakthroughs, and then the breakthroughs come. Electrification, right? It changed the whole country. Yeah, suddenly the automobile did. Right. So, in what areas do you think we need? So, progress is. It's, it sounds like you think progress is to some extent going to happen, but it, it seems like this, there are certain things that we could probably do proactively to uh, promote progress, to, to accelerate this uh, this trend. In what areas do you think we can do the most? I mean, this is an, is this an issue of education? Is this an issue of uh, you mentioned regulation? What, what are the things that we can, as a, as a society, as a culture, change or invest in to, to accelerate uh, the, the future progress? Because as you said, the compounding effect makes a small difference huge over time. Well, for the United States, my first wish would be more high-skilled immigration. My second wish would be greater freedom to build. So it's not so expensive to live in the Bay Area. Uh, but I just think there's so many little things, like take supersonic flight. Yeah. Uh, some time ago, you know, directions were given to the FAA to come up with new regulations that may, maybe possibly it could be allowed. So United just purchased 15 airplanes uh, from Boom that can fly at supersonic speed. But the regulatory framework hasn't caught up yet. And the incentives of the regulators are just awful and sluggish and so many little obstacles like pebbles in a stream. When you add them all up, they slow down progress a great deal. And you see most of those as, as kind of government policy or regulatory policy? I think government's the number one source, but I, I don't think we should run away from seeing it as a broader cultural problem. That if you have a highly risk averse, complacent society, people will start to believe progress doesn't matter that much. They'll be content just to have an ordinary career where they don't work hard to change things. I think it's much broader than government. So, What's your view about how we change that? I mean, is, is education part of that? Is there a way to disrupt education that, you know, the education that has led people to be complacent, that has led to this kind of risk aversion, which I think is, I agree, is, is, is suppressing innovation and suppressing progress? Well, the internet is that great disruptor, right? So, so many people, especially abroad, but everywhere, take inspiration from the internet, are trying to do new and better things, so I think the disruption has come. I mean, if the internet doesn't do it, uh, I'm not sure we're gonna get a better, bigger disruption, you know, 10, 20 years from now. So, but again, I'm, I'm quite optimistic there. You could say the internet makes smart people smarter and stupid people stupider. Uh, there is a problematic side to that, but mm -hmm. overall, I think it's a big game. No, I agree completely. It's, uh, if, if, if the world is gonna change for the better, it's gonna be through better communications through the internet and, and the, 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 the disruptive impact that that has. You're already seeing that, I think, in education in all levels where 
maybe maybe COVID is another way in which this will accelerate. People have discovered that they can manage yes. through the internet. Just researchers deciding, look, I want my work to matter against COVID. I'm going to put a preprint online for free right now. And they all did it. And then they talked about their, their work over Twitter or email, WhatsApp groups. Uh, phenomenal advances. I think we're just seeing the beginning of this new world. So you, you, you've written a bunch about um, uh, science funding and, and the, the challenges that we face today with science funding. Uh, obviously, science is kind of at the root of this progress. You need good science so that good innovators and engineers and, uh, can, can use their you know, ingenuity to create stuff. How do we fix? Does science funding need fixing? And if so, how do we fix it? It needs fixing. It's too based on consensus. Uh, approving something that no one finds objectionable. And it's too conservative, it's too risk averse. We need to empower more, I would say, lone individuals who can spend money flexibly on very short notice. So uh, I'm not hopeful that we will do that. And I think private philanthropy is often as bad as the government, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I do favor the government spending more on science, but most of all, they've got to spend it better. So during the pandemic, you know, you could put in a grant request to the NIH and oh, a six to nine month time cycle. Like what, what is that? That, yeah. that cannot be right. Yeah. I mean, just reading about the mRNA and, and you know, the difficulty that the, the original researchers had in getting grant money and getting, getting research funding to do the kind of basic science that got us to where we are today. Um, I mean, it took heroic efforts by certain individuals, certain yes. individual scientists. Yes, who hung up. on, like true, true Randian heroes, you might call them. Yep. Uh, but I, what I see in private philanthropy is a conservatism, uh, not really much better than in government. They're like big staffs, comfortable positions, uh, desire to avoid criticism, be politically correct, uh, not enough sense of the heroic being possible. Now you, you're doing something, uh, Emergent Ventures, where you're trying to, uh, an alternative uh, to this? Tell us a That's little bit correct. about that. That's my personal project. There's two parts of it. Uh, one is Emergent Ventures. Those are typically grants for talented young people. There's a one-page application. You're never asked where you went to school. Uh, no letters of recommendation. You don't, didn't have to suck up to your high school teachers. Just tell me who you are and what's your idea. Mm. And you have a chance. There's one layer of no, not a committee, it's me. There's an offshoot of that called Fast Grants, which raised a lot of money and got it to anti-COVID researchers very quickly. We raised over $50 million. Oh. And at a time when the NSF, the NIH, Ivy League schools were only slowly putting together money, we were getting researchers money within two to three days. And I think we had a strong impact in accelerating a lot of the advances that we saw. That's great. And, and uh, do you have any sense that you're having an, uh, an impact on, on private philanthropy to, in terms of changing their ways? Many private philanthropists conferred with me and had calls about how they might in some way learn from this. Uh, I don't know what they're gonna do. I don't necessarily expect it to happen. I think you have to be willing uh, to endure a lot of criticism and mm -hmm. just not be focused on your, your reputation per se. Do you have any views on this latest bill that just passed the, the, the Senate with $250 billion for R&D? Well, it's very disappointing. My hope was they would set up new independent agencies separate from the NSF and NIH that would take more chances and be more flexible. They decided not to. So I think it's, in that sense, a big failure. Afraid to take chances. It was not anyone's political priority. Joe Biden is not really an innovative president and uh, could have been much better. How do, how, how do we bring to science funding kind of the, the venture capitalist attitude? Well, venture capital itself does some of it, right? Yeah. But venture capital is pretty specialized and it doesn't work in every area. It doesn't work when there's a 20 year time horizon. Uh, I think educating private philanthropists, I think the new generation of tech money maybe hasn't decided what it will do, but it is thinking about philanthropy very differently, and I hope that will be better. Uh, we'll see. Again, with the internet, I think we're going to see a lot of innovation in philanthropy. But so far, I see a lot of bureaucracy.
All right, so we're, we're, we're uh, optimistic, but. <laughs> Correct, yes. often a good attitude. It's yeah. one of these, you can look at something for five, 10 years, and it doesn't seem to change that much, but over 25 years, you can wake up and, you know, things are really different. We've yeah. seen that in so many different parts of, uh, of human history. So um, it seems like there was a period, I don't know if it started in the 80s, um, where entrepreneurship was celebrated in the culture, if we talk about culture's attitude towards mm -hmm. growth. And uh, today, there seems to be an enormous amount of skepticism towards entrepreneurs and uh, from the top down, but it seems to be all over the culture. Um, how, do we, how do we make entrepreneurs cool again, I guess? How do we, how do we shift that? Uh, some of it is the entrepreneurs themselves have to be cool, right? Um, <laughs> Not everybody can be uh, can can be Steve Jobs, I guess. Yeah, we you know we need a more diverse set of entrepreneurs. I think we're getting it. Uh, I think people like Elon Musk, Patrick Collison have had a big impact as both doers and thinkers. So on that, I'm pretty optimistic. Uh, but look, as you know, there's a whole left wing view like wealth is evil or wealth is to be criticized. Uh, the wealthy people are responsible for the poverty in the world and so on. And this is quite prevalent in academia, in the media. Uh, that's it's going to be a tough slog. It's much worse than it had been, in my opinion. You may have your own view, but I think it was much better in the 1990s than it is right now. And yeah, I think that's the case. I think I think there was there was a shift. I think it was negative in the 70s and there was a shift during the 80s that in the 90s, we kind of benefited from, and there was definitely a, a certain energy and excitement around entrepreneurship and admiration for technology and admiration for entrepreneurs that we just don't have today. I think with the vaccines, the space rockets, uh, other advances, I think we're going to get it back. I'm optimistic. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, the, the left, I've, I've noticed the left is now spinning the vaccines as a government project and, and trying to take away the credit from Moderna and from the the uh, the biotech company in Germany that really did the the innovative work and 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 created this. So that's a good sign, though. I don't agree with that line, but that's the kind of victory I'll take. <laughs> yes. Um, so what do we understand in terms of economics, but in terms of kind of the broader? Uh, the broader academic research. What, what do we understand about progress? What, what do we know works? What do we understand about what's happened over the last 250 years? I mean, I, I, I've spoken to Deirdre McCluskey, who's, who's of course written extensively about uh, you know, the, the, the changes that happened um, about 250 years ago that brought about capitalism and that brought about the wealth that we have today. To what extent is that, is, is there a view out there in academia that is well understood and uh, to what extent are people looking at it? I think most people work on their own small projects and their ideas about bigger picture items they get from NPR or maybe from the New York Times. Uh, and that's not so great. Yep. I agree with most of Deirdre's work, probably would second most of what she told you. Uh, I think some combination of you know, freedom for the individual to create, presence of incentives, having some kind of ethos that you can get something done, I think is very, very important above and beyond material incentives. People have to believe in the importance of what they're doing. Uh, you see creativity in different kinds of societies all around the world. I think the creative impulse is in fact distributed evenly around the globe, but good institutions are not. And this belief in science, and being self-critical, what Karl Popper talked about, being open to refutation, uh, all of that's important. And you need a lot yeah, of I mean, different pieces to fit together. Yeah. I mean, this idea of, of, of attitudes, you know, wanting to wanting me to be successful, but also believing that success is a good thing, that there's a yeah. small view of, of success. And, and well, that's the one that worries me, right? Because as we talked about before, this attitude towards entrepreneurs uh, it worries me in the culture that we don't have that moral view of, of success, of flourishing, of, of achievement. That we, that we need wealth to pay the bills, right? Is it some accident that like the US, Southern England, Germany are the leading, Switzerland, leading pharmaceutical, biomedical powers in the world? Of course not. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Um, now, it seems like, as you said, since the article you published, there seems to be a progress movement. Um, uh, there seems to be a lot of people who have started working on this. What do you think we don't understand? I think we understand much more about how to wreck progress than how to create it. <laughs> so plenty of countries have wrecked it, right? Very effectively. What you actually do to get this powerful ethos off the ground of success matters and you can believe in your own potency. I don't think we understand that very well at all. Yes, incentives matter. We know basic economics. We're, we're in pretty good shape on that. But ideologically, how do you get into a better place? I think we're, our knowledge base there is very primitive. And 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 do you see people making progress there? I mean, are people are people? Do you see any movement in that in that sphere? I certainly see people working on it. Uh, you know, whether it's progress, I don't think we know whether their answers are correct. So, as I mentioned, I'm a fan of Deirdre's books on the Industrial Revolution. But I don't think all of her claims are, are, are proven or demonstrated. I, I don't mean that in a critical way, but sure. you see people disagreeing a lot. Well, the influence of Christianity, how much positive, how much negative, and so on. Uh, yeah. I don't think we have a very good handle on that. So certainly I don't. No, I, yeah, and I, I, that's one I probably disagree with the other on. So, so absolutely, the, the influence of Christianity. So um, it's, these are interesting and, and fascinating questions that need to be studied. Yeah. Um, do you see any challenges politically for the progress movement? Is it is is there a risk that this gets captured by one political tribe and they're becoming more like tribes by the day, um, or or is this maybe the beginning of a new political realignment and maybe something new in the political scene? I don't view it as a political movement. And I, I'm not even sure I want it to be a movement at all. So I want it to influence people. But movements, as you indicate, can be captured. And both Patrick and myself have been quite careful not to make the progress thing something that we own. Sure. We fully understand how much bigger it is than any of us. And we want there to be competing versions of it and versions we disagree with. So I view it more as like open source intellectual software that I hope people build upon. But I don't want there to be like a branded version of this is the progress studies movement. I think that would be counterproductive and we're, we're not ready for it either. Yep. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and what, is, what are your thoughts on, on the role of a, a culture's attitude towards failure? Um, I mean, there's a lot being written about Silicon Valley and failure and a lot of comparisons, I think, between the US and Europe and maybe why we have more entrepreneurs than most places in Europe. I think that's important, and it relates to Israel, as you indicated. Uh, the Bay Area in particular, but all of the U.S., you can fail, and you are typically given another chance. There's even, in some places, a kind of prestige to failing. Like, people are impressed that you tried. Yes, yes. But in so much of Western Europe, you are branded as a failure, and you just, like, have to go away and work in a regular job, and that's it. It's over. Yeah, and it, it really is tragic in Western Europe. I mean, there's so much potential talent there that is, I think, crushed by this attitude towards failure. And you're right, in Israel is very different. The attitude toward, in Israel is very much a Silicon Valley type of attitude. F you know, failure, you tried, you know, it's an opportunity to try again and to try, try differently. And I think in Israel, it's the political and cultural history, uh, the ups and downs of the Jewish people over history, there's a bouncing back, obviously. Yes, and, and, and we like to, you know, the other aspect, I think, of, of Isra Israeli culture, but more broadly, maybe Jewish culture, is the fact that we love to argue, right? That, that we love the debate. We love the back and forth. We love the iterations. And, you know, I think that spurs intellectual curiosity and spurs you to go in directions that, that uh, a more static society doesn't, doesn't do. Yes. So those uh, those uh, dinner time arguments turned out to be a, a plus for Israeli society. Um, you recently, I saw I saw a post that you did. You went to Silicon Valley to see if it was over, right? Because there's so much yeah. press about the death of California, and uh, while a lot of bad stuff is going on in California, you came back saying, "No, Silicon Valley is 
is, uh, you know, still strong and vibrant. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and, and why you think Silicon Valley is, has the ability to sustain itself. Well, I think, first of all, governance in the state of California is abysmal, and it's especially bad in the city of San Francisco. And I'm not sure the city will bounce back as a tech center, uh, but Silicon Valley is not the city of San Francisco. It is primarily suburbs, and you are fairly well insulated from a lot of the problems of governance, such as crime, bad schools. Uh, you're removed from it. Now, you pay a steep price for that removal, but nonetheless, if you're creating enough wealth, I think that's sustainable. It's a shame it has to be done that way, but I see a lot of people going back and there is no other central area. It's not Miami, it's not Austin. And I do think over time, as in all successful revolutions, it will be more decentralized, but the Bay Area will remain the mothership and it will, by having all these children and grandchildren, in a sense, uh, become more important but in a way, yes, less central, of course, like just that we have Israel. That's wonderful. Sure. Uh, it makes the U.S. less central, but it's also a way that other people build on what are partly American innovations. Or there's back and forth, carrying of knowledge each way and so on. It helps the tech scene in New York City that there's Israel and uh, very fruitful partnerships. Yeah, in the, in the late, it was a mid to late 70s, I, I was working as an engineer. Uh, a civil engineer in those days, um, uh, and uh, in in the first high tech park in Israel, we we built Intel's headquarters uh, and and manufacturing plant. There was the first clean room Israel ever there was ever built in wow. Israel, and it's it's amazing. All the big uh, U.S. tech firms were building in Israel at the time, and what it is, I don't think anybody could have predicted uh, the, the amazing effect that has had on entrepreneurship and on Israeli society. Yeah. And now, it, you know, in India, the same thing's happening, obviously, with at a greater scale. But I think they are the next country to really come online in tech in a big way. So what makes Silicon Valley Silicon Valley? Why did it happen there, in a sense? I mean, you mentioned that as one of the things that you think progress studies should look at, is why, a, why are particular locations, a particular points in time so successful? Well, California has been an intellectual leader, not always in good ways, to be clear, in the U.S. for a long time. But there is a more open mentality there, again, not always in good ways, uh, greater willingness to experiment. Kooks and weirdos are welcome. I think having a lot of defense contracting near the early parts of Silicon Valley was a factor, though by no means sufficient. But it gave something to get people started with, mm -hmm. uh, with chips and the like. And it just brought a lot of engineers into the area. And then these things are self-sustaining. Once you're a center, other people move there. And it's been off and running for a long time. Um, it's great universities, of course. Yeah, uh, Stanford, Berkeley. And uh, uh, the and weather, I don't know if that's a factor, but if you just tell someone you can live in California, I think it sounds, or at least used to sound, very attractive. Yes, yes. Good weather helps. There's no yeah. question. Um, and then you get these networking effects. How, how important do you think is these networking effects, uh, the availability of talent, the, the, the relationships between people, the interconnection between them in one geographic location? Oh, incredibly important. And you see this in the norms of Silicon Valley. So you are kind of expected to help other people for free. Yeah. And if you look at, say, the New York finance community, you see the other person is your competitor, which might in fact be true, but you really do not help them for free. And the extent to which people communicate and help each other for free uh, is still very strong and up and running. And that's a great culture. And do you think that's something that, uh, you know, given Zoom and given, given the, the interconnectivity in the world, it's something that can be, uh, you know, can be done on a, on a larger scale through, through technology? Somewhat larger scale, but I'm not sure how it will work. So the Bay Area, it's kind of small mm -hmm. in the sense that it's not evenly spread out, even in the Bay Area. So if yeah. you don't cooperate with others, the word does get out that you're not a cooperator. Uh, that can scale somewhat, but I don't think just doing it all over, all on Zoom across billions of people scales. 
So uh, that's one reason why the Bay Area won't lose all of its advantages, but we can scale it more than we have. Israel also, right? A pretty small community in a way. And yep. it's mostly in or near Tel Aviv. Yep. Indian tech is going to be way more complex, way more spread out across different languages, different religions. Uh, it's going to be a challenge. What do you different think right casts? now? Yeah, go ahead. Different castes too. Um, what do you think the biggest um, political challenges we face right now with regard to progress? And are you optimistic or pessimistic in this realm? Uh, I think public opinion on economic policy in most of the world has gotten worse over the last 25 years. Uh, I think people in government have not improved on the same questions. So that's a matter of great concern. Uh, the rise of China as a force, it's not that I think China will take over the world, but I do think it is intent on spreading a particular set of autocratic ideas that I consider pernicious. That's mm -hmm. a challenge. Uh, so I think our challenges are really quite large. Uh, not obvious we're, we're gonna beat them all back. So what extent do you think people have learned the wrong lessons from China and uh, you know, the West is becoming more like China rather than China becoming more like the West with, with central planning and, and maybe even with the, ex with the extent of lockdowns? Well, I think we had the planning idea anyway, but my worry with China is the kind of countries and in intermediate stages copy it a great deal, like a place like Ethiopia, say. Yeah. Uh, what the US is, again, in good and bad ways, but it's way more locked in than, say, East Africa is. So I think there's a very real chance just a great number of intermediate level countries go the wrong route rather than the freedom route. And there's a lot of evidence for that. And US soft power, uh, I think the internet actually gives it another new boost because most countries people are reading the English language internet, not the Chinese internet. Yep. So that's a big thing in our favor. But you look at actual policies, you see many countries going in this anti-liberty direction. And, uh, and within the US, what, what do you see the, the, the direction going in the US and, and how does that interact with this with how you see progress in the future? Well, I find it very troubling that we have two administrations in a row that are just addicted to the idea of sending people trillions of dollars mm -hmm. for nothing. And again, you can make an argument, well, it was a pandemic, we should have done a lot of it, but, but putting that aside, it feels to me like the addiction is more permanent and we're just gonna keep on doing it to shut people up. And it's obviously not good economics and it encourages the wrong mentality, the free lunch mentality. And things like all hiking the minimum wage, again, whatever you think of the debates, it's the one-time redistribution mentality. It's not the, how do we make people more productive each and every year of their lives mentality. It's in the wrong direction. And there's so much of it, very pernicious. So, so in that sense, do you think it's gonna sustain kind of the, the, the fact that the middle class or the lower middle class is going to see no progress and that the, the top 15, 20%, that's where all the progress happens because it seems like these are the kind of policies that do that. Well, I think, you know, the, the, the progress breakthroughs we're seeing now are changing that. So the vaccines, most of the lives they're saving yeah. are people in service jobs or poorer individuals. It's not that, you know, Bill Gates was getting COVID in the status quo ex ante. He's someone who can afford to avoid it. So again, I'm hopeful, but I just see so many bad ideas, so popular. And the bad ideas are linked to bad cultural views. It's not just economics. And when it gets so deeply into the culture, like this is give everyone everything for free and we can do that. It's almost a kind of like savages mentality. And that the, to see that having advanced so far in the West is very disturbing. Yeah. So when you see the, the, how well technology stocks and the stock market generally has done, but primarily technology, crypto, things like that have done uh, over the, over, during the pandemic and now in 2021, does that suggest to you that there's breakthroughs uh, you know, that people are observing and pricing into the market? Or, or, or is this just uh, asset inflation? I think big breakthroughs priced in. I don't think it's mainly asset inflation. Uh, 
So investors are smart. They're in a sense, the smartest people. They have real money on the line. Mm -hmm. And the, the tech sector has very consistently outperformed expectations. We need to take that seriously and update our views about the future, right? That's yeah, it, where the action is. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I feel that it's, it's the, on the one hand, you look at politics and you look even at culture and it's easy to get depressed. It's easy to be pessimistic. And then you look at technology and you look at innovation and you look at vaccines and you look at biotech and, and it's exciting and it's thrilling and it's in, 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 in prog major progress is, is happening and you, and, and that leads to optimism. Where did, how does that all end up in terms of, in terms of, uh, uh, playing out in, in, in your view. And is there an alternative to the U S is, is some other place in the world have the potential to, to put it all together in a more, in a more sustainable way. I think the future will feel very weird. This conjunction of the very good and the very bad will intensify. And mm. none of us are quite used to that. The eighties and nineties felt more like a smooth wave of a bunch of pretty good things. Uh, and we'll be confused and disoriented. I mean, I think a lot of countries have already put it together, uh, not at our scale, but I mean, look at Singapore, right? Or even Canada. Canada is about as free as the United States now in, in economic terms. I would prefer it would be much freer, Yep. but they've way gotten their act together compared to say the seventies. And they've done very well with per capita income. And it's, you know, a pretty coherent place. It's not gonna fall apart. Uh, so many countries have made a lot of progress, even with all the mess. I think uh, England is kind of now doing a turnaround, mm -hmm. not finished, but uh, I'm hopeful there. I mean, I've, I've been reading, I mean, even Sweden has made, I mean, Bernie Sanders' play, favorite places in Scandinavia have turned around dramatically from the kind of socialist policies of the 70s and 80s. Yes. And since the 90, I mean, Sweden has an entrepreneurship rate that is second, I think, only to Silicon Valley because of some of that deregulation and change in cultural attitude uh, towards progress, really. And I think spread of the English language is a big, big thing. I know it's obvious, but we don't talk and think about it enough. And again, it makes this connectivity so much easier. So it makes yeah. it so. Uh, it makes you want to live on the internet. You, again, China aside, you have to know English. And even the French now proudly learn English and they've kind of yep. dropped the old line they used to have, like, oh, we're only going to speak French, whatever. That's gone. It's gone. I know. It's amazing. I, yeah. I remember the days where you went to Paris and they literally would not reply if you spoke English to them. And That's today right. it's completely gone, completely different. Yep. It's so uh, a lot to be hopeful about. Yep. I, I agree. So, um, what is what in your view is is the most exciting technology? I think you told us in biology. And what do you think is the most overrated technology right now? You know, I am personally still skeptical about space. I would love if it could work out. Like my heart is with it. <laughs> but if you had to sit me down, put me in a debate, like what are we going to do up there? I don't have a good answer. So I'm kind of bearish on that, even though the whole thing excites me. Yeah. Uh, until we've like filled up Nevada, I don't really get what's so special about Mars. <laughs> well, then you get to start over maybe. Maybe it's the idea that you start over and you can create something new without the, the baggage of, of what the question is, will you take the baggage with you? If you read about the strain that space and space travel place on the human body, I think we're very, very far from any kind of real autonomy up there. And look, if people wanted to start over, they actually could do it here on the ocean, yep. remote parts of the earth. There's no demand to do it, whether one agrees with that or not. So I don't know. I think the space thing, I'm still a skeptic. Yeah. And uh, in terms of what you're most excited about, because we want to end on a positive. Well, I think longevity research, mm -hmm. which I never took seriously, but the last two years, I've read a lot more about it. I think it is in some way going to work, not the extreme scenarios that people live forever or even live to 200, but I think people can live much longer and we're making a lot of progress rapidly. And I'm not sure I will benefit from it, uh, but my daughter and her children will, and that's a big deal. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think that that's, it, that's exciting and 
uh, young people are going to benefit from that to a, tremendously if it's if it's allowed to 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 advance and if yes. it's allowed to happen. Good. Well, thank you. I really appreciate appreciate uh, the time and appreciate your thoughts. Keep and, up the good work on behalf of progress, so to speak. Yes, definitely. We, we will we will continue uh, to march ahead. And and I agree. I mean, a, a, a big challenge is is the cultural changes that need to happen and. Uh, and much of what I do, and I know much of what you do, is focused on trying to change that culture uh, to be more pro-growth. So thank you. Thank you for everything that you do. Good chatting with you, and take care. You too. Thanks, Tyler. Bye. Bye.